So we are in part two of this um, series in our Love Dark campaign. And today's message is simply titled Love the City. We want to love the city of uh, Dar es Salaam. And we're in the book of Nehemiah, uh, specifically in chapter six. The name Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. So we are trusting that today God's word will be a comfort to us. Today is a milestone as we celebrate six years. And in Nehemiah chapter 6, we see how Nehemiah and the Israelites reach a milestone and the significance of reaching a milestone. And there's some lessons there for us as we reach this milestone. The background on this man, Nehemiah, is that while he was living in exile, he was called by God to go and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, which was the main city of the Jewish people. Up until then, he had been cupbearer to the king of Persia. And that would involve things like tasting the king's wine to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. Uh, so that was his role. And in the first chapter of this book, the story starts in a really dramatic way. Uh, Nehemiah hears about these broken walls. And as he hears about these walls, his heart is broken. And God speaks to him, Nehemiah uh, goes into a time of weeping and fasting and praying. And, and from there, he then moves to Jerusalem. Now, the, the Bible doesn't say that Nehemiah loved the city of Jerusalem, but his response certainly shows that God had done something in his heart. He leaves this uh, important job and he moves to a home that he did not know. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of vision. He was a man of tremendous leadership ability. And when Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, he mobilizes the people. He brings them together and he calls them to this vision of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And he divides them up and says, you're going to build that part, you're going to build that part, you're going to build that part. And together they get on with this work. He assumes the role of governor of Judah. That's an important political role. So Nehemiah is actually uh, in that political space. He's in the marketplace, as it were. He wasn't full-time in a, in a church office tucked away somewhere. Many of us are in that space, in that space of, of, of being in the marketplace. And, 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 and this really speaks to the lives that many of us live day by day. Interestingly, the, the word Jerusalem, the city that, that Nehemiah goes back to, and the word Dar es Salaam, our city, they, they carry kind of the same meaning, city of peace. And, and what God wanted for Jerusalem and what God wants for our city is, is to bring His peace. And, and He brings that peace most clearly through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So would you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6 and we will read verses 1 to 16. When word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. 
Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed. Now strengthen my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elal in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. There is a milestone in this story, isn't there? And the milestone is that the wall was completed. The job was done. And I have three points that I'd like to share with us with regards to how this milestone was reached and what we can learn from it. Firstly, milestones are reached in the face of opposition. Opposition intensified as Nehemiah and his people got closer to achieving their milestone of completing the war. These enemies that we read about here had already opposed Nehemiah before. We, we see them in chapter 2. We see them in chapter 4. We see that opposition was an ongoing and intensifying challenge for Nehemiah in accomplishing what God had called him to do. So if we are working towards milestones right now, we should not be surprised if there is opposition. We should not be surprised if there is a sense in which that opposition is actually intensifying. Now, how did this opposition actually intensify? A couple of things that we can observe. Firstly, there is this deceitful invitation to meet with his enemies. In verse 2, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, come let us meet together in one of the villages. This invitation was not sincere. This invitation was deceitful because its purpose was actually to bring harm to Nehemiah. The reality is, as we press on in the purposes of God, there may be enemies around us who will oppose us through deceit, 
who will oppose us to the point where they actually want to bring us harm. There is also false accusation of a revolt against the king. It is reported among the nations. And who says it's true? Geshem. Hang on, Geshem is one of the enemies. He says it's true? Wow. That you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. The building of the wall had nothing to do with the revolt. The building of the wall was about reestablishing the people of God. It was about protecting and comforting the people of God and bringing them back to their Lord. It was not about a revolt. If anything, the king of Persia backed the building of the wall. He resourced the building of the wall. But the purpose of this was to frighten Nehemiah. Dear friends, as we advance in the purposes of God, our enemies may try to frighten us. Why? Because fear has a way of paralyzing us and bringing us to inaction. And that is what enemies would want. We also see that there is false prophecy. I realized in verse 12 that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. This was Shemaiah, and Shemaiah was actually an Israelite. He, unlike Geshem and the others, was an insider, and he actually had access to the temple, which suggests that he was probably a priest. And he had been hired by these outsiders to intimidate Nehemiah so that Nehemiah would sin and be discredited. So that his integrity would be undermined. One of the things that enemies would do as we move towards milestones is they would want to discredit and undermine integrity. False prophecy can lead in the wrong direction. And that's why the Bible says we should have discernment. The Bible actually says we should weigh prophecy. It says we should test everything. We need to do that, especially in a tense environment like the one in which Nehemiah was in. Now, Nehemiah's story shows us that loving the city will face opposition. If you want to love Dar es Salaam, guess what, dear friends? There will be opposition. It's not going to be smooth sailing. If you want to fulfill the things that God has called you to do, it's not going to be a walk in the park. There will be opposition. And as you get closer to achieving the things that God has put on your heart, the opposition is likely to get even more intense. Now, there is another one who loved Jerusalem and faced opposition for his love for Jerusalem. His name is Jesus Christ. And for Jesus, it was actually worse because for Jesus, the primary opposition was not enemies outside looking on saying, hey, what do you think you're doing? The primary opposition was from within Jerusalem itself. And for Jesus, the opposition actually went all the way to death on the cross. Far worse than what Nehemiah faced. Far worse than what any of us have ever faced. In Matthew 23, verse 37, these are the words of Jesus. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. What did Jerusalem do to Jesus? It killed Jesus. As we love the city of Dar es Salaam, we will be opposed. There will be those who will try and make us afraid. There will be those who will try and discredit us. If that is your portion today, you are in good company. You are right up there with Nehemiah. You are right up there with our Lord Jesus. Amen. Secondly, we see that milestones are reached by determination. 
While opposition was getting stronger, Nehemiah's determination increased. And Nehemiah showed his love for the city of Jerusalem by not giving up, by not giving up on the work of building the walls, the work that God had called him to do. Nehemiah was determined. He was determined not to live in denial. In verse 2, he knows that his enemies wanted to harm him. In verse 8, he acknowledges that they are lying. In verse 9, he understands that they want to frighten him. In verse 13, he is aware that they want to discredit him. This was not a leader who had buried his head in the sand. His determination was a determination where he was well aware of what was going on and acknowledged it for what it was. Nehemiah was determined not to lose focus. Verse 3 and 4, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? He was telling his enemies what his priority was. Nehemiah kept burning with the vision that God had put in him. Nehemiah kept pressing forward with the call of God on his life. He knew why he was there, and despite the opposition, he was determined to stay focused. You see, opposition has a way of making things cloudy. Opposition has a way of making things blurry, and all of a sudden, things are no longer as clear as they used to be. The vision is not quite as strong as it was, but Nehemiah had tunnel focus. Why should I come down? To you, I am about a great project. And it wasn't as though these enemies came once or twice, three times, four times, the fifth time. They kept coming back. Nehemiah remains resolute. He remains focused on the thing that God has called him to do. I will not be distracted. I will not be deterred. I will not come down. I am about a great project. Nehemiah was determined to keep praying. Verse 9, but I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Looks at the situation, sees the circumstances. What's the response? I prayed, I prayed, Lord, strengthen my hand. Verse 14, remember to buy and sample at my God because of what they have done. What's he doing? He's praying. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. He was a man of prayer right from chapter 1. He continues being a man of prayer chapter after chapter. And we meet him here in chapter 6 as the opposition is intensifying. What is he doing? He is praying. Dear friends, if you are going to stand in the face of opposition, if you are going to be determined in the face of opposition, you need to be a man of prayer. You need to be a woman of prayer. You need not to look to your own strength. You need not to look even to those around you. Yes, they can encourage, but first and foremost, you need to turn to God. You need to strengthen yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord. You need to pray. Nehemiah kept going, he kept pushing forward, he kept building, he kept inspiring his people to do the same. Nehemiah showed his love for Jerusalem by not giving up on the work of building the walls. God had done something in his heart. God had placed something so strong and so deep in him that he was willing to keep going. You see, friends, there is a standing firm that is standing firm just to hold your ground. But there is a standing firm which you you are actually taking ground in the face of opposition. You are actually moving forward in the face of opposition. You are actually taking something from the enemy that the enemy wants to take from you. And that is what Nehemiah was doing. He was pressing on, moving forward despite the intensity of the opposition. And he did that as a man of prayer. Jesus, our great Lord and Savior, he also showed his love through the determination for Jerusalem that he had in the face of opposition. 
In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, At the, As the time approached, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Yes, Jesus was going to be taken up to heaven. He was going to be glorified in this magnificent way. But before he would be taken up to heaven, what waited for Jesus in Jerusalem was beating, was mocking, was flogging, was betrayal, was crucifixion, death by crucifixion. This is what Jesus had resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem for. In the face of knowing this is what is coming, that word resolutely means with determination. It means with focus. It means with perseverance. He had resolutely determined to go to Jerusalem. Like Nehemiah, Jesus would not come down. You see, Nehemiah didn't come down from the wall. He said, I am about a great project. I cannot go down to you. Well, Jesus would not come down from the cross because on the cross, Jesus was about a great project. He was about the project of saving us from our sins. He was about the project of building the people of God. He was about the project of extending grace to a lost humanity. He was about the project of bringing us into the family of God and giving us the gift of eternal life. He could not come down. He was about a great project. Luke 27, 39 to 42. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Who are you going, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Yes, Jesus was about building. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Jesus stayed on the cross. He could not come down. Dear friends, are you facing opposition as you build your part of Dar es Salaam? You see, each and every one of us here has been put in a part of the city of Dar es Salaam to be a builder, to take our position and build. And perhaps you're facing opposition. And, and there's, there's different aspects to the wall that God has given us. There is our, our relationships. That's part of the wall we're building. Our marriages. Our, our, our children, our families. There's, there's other parts of the wall which are our, our businesses, our jobs, our companies, our organizations. We're building. We're building the city. We're building the city. There's our churches, our mission organizations. We're building the city. We're building the city. And as, you, and as you're building, perhaps you are facing opposition. As, as you look to the milestones, as you think ahead, I, I want to reach some milestones. I see some milestones ahead. You are facing opposition. What would Nehemiah say to us today? What would the Word of God say to us today? Keep building. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep going. You have a purpose. You have a reason. God has placed you there for something. 
do not come down. Do not come down because you are about a great project. You are about a great work in the city of Dar es Salaam. Amen. You and I will show our love for the city through our determination. And you know, the thing with determination is, it's not just, I'm going to grit my teeth and try harder. Nehemiah's determination was rooted in something that God did in his heart right at the beginning. He was actually a broken man. He was a man who had wept and fasted and was continuously in prayer. He was so connected to God. His determination was a product of his connection to God, of his intimacy to God, of God having ruined his heart for the things that he had called him to. So determination, dear friends, is not, well, you know what, tomorrow I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to do it in my own strength. Yes, we need to make a decision. We need to decide that we will not give up. We will keep going. But man, the strength, the power comes from the Lord. So we plug into him, we turn to him, and we say, Lord, Nehemiah is the guy who said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It is because of the Lord that we have the strength to keep on going. And we love this city as we keep on going. Our third and final point is that milestones demonstrate the faithfulness of God. One of my favorite uh, verses in this whole book of Nehemiah is verse 15, which says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elal in 52 days. It was completed. After Nehemiah had prayed, after they had prayed, what happened? Well, the job was done. It is finished. Despite the opposition, despite the tough conditions, the work of rebuilding the walls was done. What followed prayer was success. It is finished. Nehemiah was a finisher. He was a completer. Him and his team, these guys saw through what they had started. And what I, when I read this, I, I stand in faith. I say, God, I trust you that the role you have given us in building this city, what you have begun, you will see through to completion. We will be finishers as well. We will do the job that is before us. And the job that is before you, in your family, in your community, in your society, in your job, in your organization, you can finish that job because God is with you. God is faithful. You see, God is faithful even when we are not faithful. God is faithful even when we mess up. I mean, we might look at Nehemiah and say, this guy, he's just so remarkable. Where, where are the mistakes? It just seems like everything's going right. Well, we know for, for a fact that we make mistakes. We know for a fact that we take the wrong steps, make the wrong decisions, say the wrong things. We lack faith here. We lack faith there. But it is because God is faithful. God is faithful, dear friends. The enemies that had surrounded him they became afraid. In verse 16, it says, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. The help of our God is what made all of the difference for Nehemiah. The help of our God was the game changer for Nehemiah. It's what made all the difference. With God, we can achieve what looks impossible through human eyes. And what God does through us will speak for, ourselves, for itself. You see, we, we don't have to 
go to someone and say, hey, look, this is God. God is doing this. We don't have to intimidate our enemies and say, hey, listen, you need to stop what you're doing and, 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 and pull out the riot act on them. Yes, there is a place for, there's an appropriate place for confrontation. But man, for Nehemiah, he, he tells them, you guys are just speaking things out of your head. And then he g- gets on with it. And the result is, as, as the work is done, as it's finished, actually, the guys opposing are like, man, you know what? Now we are afraid. We wanted them to be afraid. We are now afraid because we actually see that God is here. This is God's hand upon this work here. So we don't have to be out there saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove myself. No, get on with the work of God and let God receive the glory and God show himself through what you are doing. God loves Dar es Salaam more than we do. Why can we say that God loves Dar more than we do? Well, God sent Jesus Christ to die for the six million people of Dar es Salaam. That, that's how much God loves the city. So can we say that God is faithful to Dar? Absolutely. Can we say that God will finish his work for Dar? Absolutely, because he loves it more than any of us ever could. We just need to take our position and faithfully trust him as he carries on his work through us. There's someone else that is a finisher, and I'm coming to land soon. And that's Jesus Christ. Moments before Jesus died, what did he say? John 19, 30. He said, it is finished. Jesus did all the work paying for our sins. Everything that was required paid in full for every sin. It is finished. Everything that was needed to build the people of God, to build his church, it is finished. As we celebrate this milestone of six years, I'm excited. I'm grateful. The appropriate response is, thank you, Lord. Thanksgiving. Oh, we're so grateful, Lord. You have been faithful. Thank you for seeing us through the challenges. Thank you for giving us determination. Thank you for helping us to stay strong and resolute to keep pressing on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. But beyond thank you, God, we we can also look to the future with eyes of faith, can't we? And we can say, God, we believe that greater things are yet to come. We believe that you have more. Thank you. We believe that you still have more in store for us than what we have accomplished already. So we're marking this milestone and saying, thank you for the past. But we're also saying, God, thank you for the future. Thank you for what you are yet to do. We believe greater things are yet to come. There's more of the wall to build. See, Nehemiah, as the story continues, actually there's more things that happen. Reforming the people of God. The job is never really fully done, is it? So even as we have reached this milestone, man, there's so much more to do. And we can say, God... Greater things are yet to come. In every family in this room, every business, every job, every community, every situation, every organization, there's greater things that are still to come. We can look to the future with faith because you have been faithful. Your track record has been impeccable up until this point, and we are going to continue into the future trusting you for greater things. We have a song. I believe we have a song that we're going to sing just now in response to what has happened and what is yet to come. Before we sing, I'd like to pray, and I invite us to stand, if that's okay. Lord, we want to thank you for your amazing goodness to us. 
Lord, we thank you that there are things that you have called us to and there are milestones that you have for each and every person in this room. Lord, I pray that today a new sense of destiny and purpose would rise in our hearts. A new sense of calling to the city of Dar es Salaam would rise in us. Lord, we thank you for the story of Nehemiah, this political figure who loved God so much, this man of influence who had a heart to serve you and build and restore. God, I pray today that if there's anyone here who is facing opposition, Lord, that you would encourage them if there's anyone here who feels like giving up, Lord, that they would not give up, that they would keep pressing on. If there's anyone here who feels that the opposition is too great, they would see Jesus pressing on to Jerusalem resolutely with his face fully set to accomplish everything that you had called him to do through the cross that we would look to the Bible, we would look to the Word of God and find fresh courage, fresh strength to keep moving forward. God, I pray that determination would rise. Determination would rise in us, Lord. Lord, that we wouldn't just be determined to hold our ground, but we would be determined to take ground to move forward, to move forward in our marriages, to move forward with our families, to move forward in our businesses, in our companies, in our jobs, in, in building this city, in, 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 in infrastructure and in healthcare and education and all the things that are in this city. We would move forward in restoring the people of God, in restoring the house of God, in doing all that we can to bring people to see God for who He is. And Lord, that as we do that, even our enemies will see that God is here, God is with them, God is in that situation, and they would have the fear of God in them. Lord, we look to You. Thank You for all You have done. Thank you for six amazing years. Thank you for the next six. We trust that greater things are yet to come in the city of Dar. In Jesus' name, amen.